And our next speaker is Dr. Ruben Nyman, Clinical Assistant Professor of Medicine at the University of Arizona. Dr. Nyman has been a friend of the Narcolepsy Network for many, many years, and he's an international dream and sleep specialist. We are excited to hear his presentation, an integrative health approach to narcolepsy. Hello, everybody. Um, I am delighted to be here at the uh, remote Zoom Narcolepsy Network meeting for 2020. And let me go ahead and um, share my slide screen. So let's begin. Um, I'm Dr. Ruben Nyman. I'm a clinical psychologist and um, sleep and dream specialist with the University of Arizona, Andrew Weil Center for Integrative Medicine. I've been on the faculty there for 20 years and um, have been involved in sleep and dream work for uh, probably twice that amount of time. Uh, I'm happy to be here to talk about um, an integrative health approach to narcolepsy. This is a broad topic, so we'll, we'll only be able to delve into parts of it. I've spoken about aspects of this in past years, but let me begin with uh, just an excerpt from a poem to introduce this notion. This is a poem by David White called What to Remember When Waking. In that first hardly noticed moment in which you wake, coming back to this world from the other more frightening and movable world where everything began, there is a small opening into the new day which closes the moment you make your plans. What you can plan is too small for you to live. What you can live wholeheartedly will make plans enough for the vitality hidden in your sleep. To become human is to bring what is hidden as a gift to others. To remember the other world in this world is to live in your true inheritance. So an integrative approach is based in integrative medicine and you all probably recognize the founder and director of the program, Andrew Weil, pictured here on the cover of Time some years ago. Uh, integrative medicine, integrative health is now a worldwide phenomenon. There are many clinics and training programs all over. So uh, we are delighted with how uh, well this has been received. And I, I think there's some specific applications of an integrative medicine approach to narcolepsy that are worth looking at. Let me begin by saying the essence of integrative medicine is about integrating, bringing together the best of conventional, ordinary medical approaches with what has been called CAM or complementary and alternative medicine. But this is as much about bringing together the body and the mind. I think one of Dr. Weil's greatest contributions has been his, his unusual sensitivity to psychological, to mental, and what we even say, spiritual factors in health. Integrative medicine emphasizes prevention, and uh, this includes a focus on lifestyle, which we're all probably familiar with at this point, um, uh, emphasizing the importance of nutrition and exercise and stress management, and of course, it goes without saying sleep. I'm not going to touch on these today because the, the, these are broad topics that require a lot of attention, but I do want to emphasize one other critical part of integrative medicine that I think has a direct uh, direct ramifications for understanding and managing narcolepsy. And this is about um, um, recognizing the personal subjective, the, the experiential part of health and life. Uh, as a, a, a famous, the famous doctor, uh, William Osler once said, it's much more important to know what sort of patient has a disease than the sort of, patient, the sort of disease the patient has. So this is something critical in integrative medicine is really bringing your personal experience to bear on whatever health condition we're addressing. So we begin here with looking briefly at this notion of body and mind. Um, and, and I want to say it's important to recognize the body and mind as a mixed marriage. Now, I know this is in contrast to very common uh, perspectives today that say the body and the mind are one. Well, maybe they are, but there's an important kind of segregation that happens. So let's begin by looking at these cartoons. And the one on the left, the, the body-mind, the mind-body problem is described in terms of the mind saying to the body, hey, get up, and the body saying, no. 
And then we can flip this and it makes as much sense into the body mind problem where the body wants to get up and do something and the mind says no. And, and what this does is it reminds us that there's a kind of relationship inside of each of us between the body and the mind. The, the segregation, the, the, the time that the body and the mind uh, in this mixed marriage take apart is most clearly witnessed in REM sleep. We now know that REM sleep is both an out-of-body experience. If you look at it from the perspective of the mind, it's an out-of-body experience. The mind leaves the body, as in old notions that the soul leaves the body in sleep. Uh, the mind or consciousness is no longer defined or constrained by being in a body. It basically escapes, which allows us in the dream world to have this expansive experience into mystery. And if REM sleep it, from the perspective of the mind is an out of body experience. From the perspective of the body, it's an out of mind experience when the mind is no longer in the body. And this actually is reflected in some disconnection that happens between executive function in the, in the brain and lower sort of limbic system, uh, hippocampic functions, if you're familiar with that. There's a kind of separation of the, the waking self running the show, the waking mind, the ego dominating the body. So the body also gets a break in REM sleep. And this segregation allows for memory consolidation and healing and all kinds of good things. But as we go into this discussion, just keep in mind that we are chimeras. We are we're kinds of combinations. We're angel beasts. We are part mind. We're part human and part animal. The body itself is a kind of animal. So a critical step in, in understanding the implications for narcolepsy is in looking at a distinction, a parallel distinction between the body and the mind and what we're gonna call disease and illness. And I wanna begin this by showing just a quick clip from one of my all time favorite movies, Young Frankenstein, uh, which was a, a Mel Brooks film done in the 1970s. And here we have Dr. Frankenstein on your right, or Frankenstein, if you've seen the film, speaking to Igor or <clears throat> Igor. Um, in a really interesting conversation. You know, I don't mean to embarrass you, but I'm a rather brilliant surgeon. Perhaps I could help you with that hump. What hump? What hump? <laughs> what hump? So disease is objective. It, it's, it's, a, it's a measure of the body. We can measure temperature. We can measure white blood count. We can measure other kinds of changes. It's an objective measure of physicality, measures of being sick. In contrast, there's a compliment, illness is the sense, the subjective, the personal, mental, the mind experience of being sick. And they don't always overlap. It's really important to understand. Roughly 50% of people who go to see their primary care doctor show up with illness. Hey doc, I don't feel good, but there's no detectable disease. Now, in some cases that disease just hasn't been found, but in many cases, it's just not there. It's possible to have illness without disease. It's also possible to have disease, as we see in this clip, without illness. The fellow obviously has a hump, but he just doesn't recognize it. So is there a way, is there a healthy way, is there a healthier way of being sick? Is there a healthier way of having narcolepsy? So to answer that question, we need to discuss the term medicalization. And we live in a world in a culture that is heavily medicalized. And we'll talk about some of the implications of that. One of them is hexing and the other one is shame. So hexing refers to um, highly pathologizing medical conditions. And in some cases, they're not even medical conditions. They're, they're ordinary life situations that become medicalized. Uh, one good example of this is grief. Grief as challenging as it can be, is a normal experience. It's a natural experience in life. Today, uh, particularly if you're a woman and you happen to cry during a visit to your primary care doctor, there's a 75% chance that you'll leave with a prescription for an antidepressant. Grief is not depression, but we so fail to recognize some of these normal challenges in life and we, we pathologize them, we make them into illnesses and diseases. We see some of this also with attention deficit disorder. The vast majority of children diagnosed with this are boys and boys generally are a lot more active than girls. So I'm not suggesting that it isn't a valid diagnosis, but it's over diagnosed, it's over pathologized. 
So medicalization is, is a tendency to pathologize. And we look at narcolepsy as a, as a neurological disease. And again, from one perspective, if we look at it just in terms of the body, this makes sense, but it's an incomplete perspective. In part because medicalization is a kind of war. We, we look at medicine today, we look at physicians and medical providers as, as being part of an army. In fact, in, in 1972, the United States Congress literally met to declare war. That's the word they used. They declared war against cancer. We fight disease. We kill germs. We battle symptoms. It's a fighting attitude. And again, this is not to say that there aren't times when that's essentially necessary and appropriate, but the point I'm making is that it's overdone. So the, part of this is a hexing. Um, diag certain diagnoses today uh, are, are, are are condemning, you know, when someone's diagnosed with cancer, almost always there's a thought that my life is over. So there's an overreaction to this. And I think this is particularly true with narcolepsy. So key symptoms of narcolepsy, like excessive daytime sleepiness or sleep paralysis, nightmares and hypnagogic hallucinations, cataplexy, these symptoms can be incredibly challenging, but we come at them with our guns drawn. Um, we just make a presumption that they're terrible and we don't really get close enough to understand them. And this fighting attitude, we want to fight them. And in fact, a lot of the fighting, of course, is, is in terms of using medication. And many, probably most medications we use today do not cure, but they suppress symptoms. They hide the symptoms. There is something about hiding that imbues whatever we hide with shame. Here's a little experiment if you want to do it. Pick up a paper clip one morning and carry it through your day. Uh, keep it cupped, keep it hidden in your hand through the day. Don't let anybody know you have it. Don't let anybody see it. And at the end of the day, notice how you feel about it. I think you'll be surprised that after hiding something as innocuous uh, as a paper clip, the act of hiding will have imbued that with shame. It creates shame when we hide. We, we not only hide what we feel ashamed of, but we feel ashamed of the things we hide. And we hide often by suppressive medications. So narcolepsy is a condition of the body, not necessarily of the mind. Clearly, the mind reacts because these are very, very strong symptoms. But it, it, it can be helpful at this point to try to create some separation between the body and the mind when understanding narcolepsy. So is there a healthy way of having narcolepsy? And this is about considering uh, complementing the medical condition of narcolepsy with a non-medicalized view, with a non-medicalized, a non-illness view of narcolepsy. And one of the ways of doing that is understanding that in addition to being uh, a genetically, a genetic proclivity and a neurological glitch and so on medically, narcolepsy from a mind standpoint is about heightened permeability between waking and sleep and dream states. The ordinary boundary that exists between waking and sleep and dreams is very porous in narcolepsy and that creates the symptoms. Now, having said that, the question is, are there some potential benefits to that? And I'm gonna name three here. One of them is you can train to be an oneironaut. Oneironaut is a word that comes from oniris, which refers to Greek gods of sleep. And there, there is literature and a lot of people with experience who actually look at dreaming as a professional practice of sorts. It's an artistic practice. And people with narcolepsy, generally speaking, can do really well at this. They, 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 they're built to do really well at this. We can also look at narcolepsy as a special source of creativity. And there's a tremendous amount of, of anecdotal experience supporting this, and partly because of the permeability around dreaming and the creativity that's associated with, with REM sleep and dreaming. So people with narcolepsy sometimes become incredible artists dancers, poets, writers, musicians, and so on. And it's interesting to let yourself explore that. And, and, and third here in this example, um, I, I like to look at narcolepsy in terms of a, a, a personal, uh, a potential for personal spiritual experience. It does open consciousness up. That permeability creates a connection between these three primary states of consciousness between waking and sleeping and dreaming. In, in Hindu, um, in Hindu uh, traditions and yogic traditions, there, there's this chant of Om, which actually is a sound that brings together ah, 
U -m, and Aum, that sound represents the whole of consciousness. And it is an integration of waking, dreaming, and sleeping. Ah is waking, U is dreaming, M is sleeping. And so the potential to bring those together is a spiritual potential. So how might, how might we approach um, uh, narcolepsy in a healthy way, and, and um, essentially that involves cultivating a new kind of mindfulness, a willingness to, to come in a non-judgmental way, uh, a new way to look at both bodily and mind symptoms associated with narcolepsy. And let me just summarize a, a, a generally, what I think is just a, a profoundly um, productive, effective way of approaching the body. And this comes from a, a, a piece, a, a dear friend and, and a, a mentor of mine wrote some years ago. And he, he said, treat your body as you would treat your beloved pet. Body is animal. So he wrote, most of us have a more balanced sense of how to identify with a dog than with our body. We love our dog today, but we can't love our body because we are waiting for it to be different. Free of the anger that comes from unreasonable expectations, we feed our dog a good diet, a good simple diet. We exercise him and bathe him and take him to get his shots. We keep him away from dangerous situations and gently decline to give him everything he wants. There is no war. There is no war in this relationship because there is neither neglect nor a battle for perfection. A sane approach to questions about diet, exercise, sleep, and the like is to ask, if my body were my beloved pet, what would I do? So in terms of mind, be kind to your mind. Be kind, meaning approach your mind in a mindful and non-judgmental way. And so specifically with narcolepsy, let's again take these three common symptoms or, or uh, areas of related symptoms. We have excessive daytime sleepiness, we have dreaming issues, and we have cataplexy. So EDS, excessive daytime sleepiness, it's really helpful to recognize the obvious that when we are sleepy during the day, sleepiness is sleep. When we fight sleepiness during the day, we're actually developing a, 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 a a difficult relationship with sleep even when it shows up at night. Sleep fundamentally is a kind of deep serenity. It's a deep inner peace. In Hindu trad traditions, which I mentioned before, it actually, deep, deep dreamless sleep is equated to full enlightenment. It's the greatest peace that we can experience. Eckhart Tolle refers to sleep as a return to the unmanifest source, to our spiritual source. So it's helpful to begin to shift our relationship with sleep, even if it shows up at a time when we don't want it to, we can be kind to it. Dreaming, even bad dreams, good dreams and bad dreams, even nightmares, even hypnagogic hallucinations are essentially bridges to other world. Carlos Castaneda, uh, who studied this extensively with, with a shaman in Mexico, um, captured this notion in a quote. He says, dreaming gives us the fluidity to enter into other worlds by destroying our sense of knowing this world. So there's a falling apart, a deconstructive process in the world, in the hard world that we know, but something else appears. It's reminiscent, reminiscent of that old notion of that my house burned down, now I can see the moon. So there's something revealed. If, if we don't run in fear from the dream, there's an intelligence that takes us someplace. And likewise, cataplexy can be understood. I, I think of it as being on call in other worlds. It's like you have this other job and suddenly there's some urgency and you are pulled uh, to varying degrees, sometimes mildly, sometimes your entire body into this other world, into the world of dreaming uh, with a sudden onset of rametonia. And, and this, uh, I think, is so beautifully captured by an excerpt here from a poem uh, by Rumi. He says, I am part of the load not rightly balanced. I drop off in the grass like the old cave, cave sleepers. I drop off in the grass to browse wherever I fall. This is a beautiful invitation to consider cataplexy, not just in terms of where it takes us from, it takes us out of ordinary waking life, but where does it take us to? It's so interesting to open that. And I've explored this with people with narcolepsy and we have begun to experiment with some really promising results um, with techniques for 
actually controlling, learning to control cataplexy with cognitive and mindful techniques. So the first step here is not to judge it, not to fight it, to get better acquainted with where it takes us. So let me wind down here by sharing uh, another view of narcolepsy. And this might sound a little strange at first, but bear with me. Narcolepsy as crepuscular consciousness. So we, we generally think of living things, humans and animals, as being either diurnal, awake and active during the day, or nocturnal, uh, awake and active at night. But we so neglect something interesting in our world that there are many living things, including some of our favorites like cats and dogs and rabbits, many living things that are also crepuscular. Uh, crepuscular is an English word, but the, it's, it's, uh, it's more commonly used in French and crepuscule and Spanish. And basically it refers to twilight. It's that time of day, it's dusk and dawn. It's the time of day, the French say crepuscular is the time of day when you can't tell if what you're looking at is a dog or a wolf. Is it domesticated and safe or is it wild and potentially dangerous? It's that kind of day. There's a great mystery. And I think of people with narcolepsy as being crepuscular. They, they live in that in-between and in that permeable boundary uh, to twilight consciousness. We can think of it as an amphibious consciousness. Uh, this is a, a notion that, that, that artists often uh, explore. And here in the image on your left, this is a, a wonderful painting um, by Irene Hardwick Olivieri, a, a friend of mine who used to live in Tucson. And uh, it just captures this notion of amphibious consciousness beautifully, living in two places at the same time. Part of me is in the waking world and part of me is in the dream world. Part of me is in the dry world. Part of me is in the wet world. And um, again, we can begin to look at this not as a disease, but as a potentiality. It's a consciousness that connects two worlds. So to finish up, um, <clears throat> I'm left with a question. Is narcolepsy a kind of superpower? Um, my, um, my daughter-in-law um, was once having a talk with, with her son, with my grandson, who is a, an exceptionally sensitive kid. And, um, and she convinced him that his sensitivity was actually a superpower and it just changed his relationship to that entirely. Is narcolepsy a superpower, a kind of sensitivity that can connect us with other worlds? So thank you for joining me. And um, I think we will now proceed to questions and answers. I have uh, a number of questions that have been sent over so I'm gonna go ahead and, and just begin to address those. And the first one um, seems very important. The question is how can I turn narcolepsy into something positive? I often feel negative. Um, it's, it's really essentially what my talk was trying to focus on. Uh, and again, it's not about denying the real challenging medical neurological aspects of narcolepsy, but it's not about parking there. It's not about landing there. It's about taking care of that. And, and I think to, to answer the question sort of simply, it, the way to feel better about it is to notice the ways in which we judge it and to let go of those judgments. And again, that, that goes back to this notion of hexing so much of, of the, the really well-intended medical support around narcolepsy tends to focus exclusively on the, the challenging symptoms and it could put a really, uh, it, it could cast a dark shadow on it. So we need to deal with the medical issues, but realize that narcolepsy is not just that, that we can approach it in a whole different way psychologically. Um, question number two, do I recommend a specific med meditation app? Um, I, I don't, I think there are many great apps out there. Um, I think with, with all of those apps and with all of this technology, they're most useful in reminding us of something that we are capable of. It's a human capacity. Uh, often the, the, the heavy focus on disease uh, erodes what we call self-efficacy. In health psychology and medicine, we, we have this concept of self-efficacy, which is, is about understanding our, our belief in our own ability to handle something. I, I think self-efficacy is, is a scientific translation of an older term, of an older notion of having faith in oneself. 
And I think we need to hold on to that, whatever we're diagnosed with, whatever our bodies or brains are doing, uh, who we are. If we're people with narcolepsy, we are primarily people. We're not narcoleptics, as we used to say. So just to recognize that, that your personhood is primary here. So number three, be kind to yourself, you say, but my family thinks I'm lazy. I'm sorry to laugh about that. I hear it so often. How can I convince them? Uh -huh. I'm not so sure it's about um, trying to convince them. I think maybe it's more about just not having to take that on. Um, you know, I, after being a psychologist for 40 years, I'm pretty convinced we can't change other people. Uh, challenging enough for us to change ourselves. Um, but it's important not to take it on. And, and I'm sure you're aware that it's not just your family, that this is a common notion. So many people, particularly prior to diagnosis, spend years, if not decades, having a sense that they're lazy. Um, the, the word lazy is actually meaningless. It just describes the appearance of a certain behavior, somebody who's not doing something. And, and I think we need to just step past that and recognize that that somebody being still, somebody resting, somebody sleeping, somebody dreaming, somebody in cataplexy, that that's not an indication of, of uh, where they are. That's, that's an indication that they are not in this world of ordinary consciousness, but we can learn to respect in ourselves and in others that they are in another world and we can hold regard for that world. Number four, um, my dreams are so, so scary. Uh, I'm often afraid to go to sleep. What should I do? So I appreciate this question too. So, so first of all, scary dreams are not the exclusive property of, of narcolepsy. They occur in lots of people. Uh, having said that, it appears that people with narcolepsy, pro generally speaking, not everybody, but probably have more scary dreams than uh, people without narcolepsy. The, the, if I were to offer a simple answer to that, I would say consider the possibility that something that appears frightening initially is not dangerous. And, and we know this through dream research and anecdotal work in dreams. Um, dreams are perfectly safe. I'll give you an example. Uh, the scariest dreams are often dreams in which people believe that they might die. Terrible nightmares where something is chasing you or you're falling off a cliff. And um, it, there's an old wives tale that actually if you die in a dream, you're actually dead. And it's just not true. Uh, I imagine many of you listening have had dreams in which you've died. Um, I had a wonderful dream in which I was in an airplane and crashed into the Four Seasons in, in Santa Monica in LA. It, it was quite a fun death. Um, what happens in these kinds of dreams is you just get up afterwards. And I remember in my dream, a friend of mine said, hey, we're dead now. What do you want to do? Um, you can practice impunity in the dream. And, and this is easy if you have some degree of lucidity. If you're aware that you're dreaming, you know that you will awaken from the dream. And I think with practice, we can learn not to run from the things that scare us. In fact, we can learn to engage. We can, we can go into a dialogue with these things and it opens up a whole wonderful world of creativity and, and spiritual growth. Okay, we have more questions coming in. Um, somebody says, um, I don't know if I can convince people at work that I have a superpower. You know, that's the cool thing about a superpower. Don't try to convince anybody. It, it, it's your secret. Okay, uh, question, how can we learn, read more about your whole perspective, website, email? Um, I love your aim. Well, thank you. Uh, I, I should mention I have a, a, a new, um, a lengthy article coming out about dreaming uh, in, in a, a wonderful website called Aeon. It's A-E-O-N. And it's not specifically about narcolepsy, but those of you who are interested in dreams and related phenomena, um, the tentative title, it might change, is Restoring Jacob's Ladder. Healing REM Sleep and Dreams. This will be on the website. It's, it's um, complimentary, it's free to access of Aeon, A-E-O-N, uh, and it'll be released on December 24th. Uh, I look at narcolepsy as, as creative awareness. I have special senses for smelling, hearing. This is a superpower, yeah? 
and seeing things. I feel we're blessed to have narcolepsy. We have so much more than the average person. I, I really appreciate hearing this. And again, it's so touchy because we have to recognize that on the one hand, many people struggle with this. And on the other hand, it also becomes an opening. You know, my house burned down. Now I can see the moon. I've had it my whole life. I've always dealt with it. Uh, do yoga and being outside, doing yoga and being outside is so amazing. I absolutely agree with that. Um, somebody was diagnosed in July after 10 years of trying to find out what was wrong. Yeah, it's a sad but common story. When I do explain it, whoops, what just happened? Um, when I do explain it to people, they tend to brush it off even after explaining, how do I get through to people? How this affects them? You know, again, I, I think all we can do is make an effort and it's not our responsibility to change people's lives. How we are, um, is, is a, is a nonverbal message to people too. And the more comfortable we become with who we are, the more we convey that even independently of words. So I, I certainly wouldn't get into um, arguments with people about what it is. And you, you will find, of course, some people will be receptive to it and some people won't. Um, another comment, a question. I often try to explain narcolepsy to others, including my boss who doesn't understand or maybe doesn't want to understand. How would you explain it to him? You know, I think a big part of this, uh, I, I, after working in, in Sleep and Dreams for all these years, I, I do think that, and, and I've written about this in my upcoming article, I think as a culture, we're afraid of dreaming. Dreaming takes us into another world. And uh, it's a world we can't explain. We can't reduce it to, you know, brain activity, to REM sleep in the brain and so on. Um, it does open us to a world of mystery. And I think so many people are frightened of that. People are afraid of their own unconscious. And once again, uh, we can just suggest to people that there's another world there and it's worth exploring. But I don't know that we can go beyond that. Uh, I often try to explain narcolepsy to others, including my boss. Oh, we just went through that. Yes. And then... Thank you so much. Thank you for thanking me. I'm so grateful as I've, I've never heard a doctor understand this way. Can you speak to the power of connecting with the breath and balancing the nervous system? Uh, yes, I don't know if I can do it in a minute or two. You know, breathing is, is really interesting. It's the only uh, physiological function that can be completely under conscious control. We can breathe consciously or completely under unconscious control. So given that, we, we look at Breathing in some ways is being similar to dreaming. It can happen in the unconscious and consciousness. It can be this bridge that connects the conscious world and the unconscious world. So paying attention to it, um, simply watching the breath is, is, a, is a very powerful exercise in learning to trust the unconscious, to trust that there's a pattern, there's a rhythm inside of us that can actually be helpful. I'm sorry if I'm, if I'm rushing through this. Uh, I'm not sure how we're, we're doing with time. Let's see if I can finish these last couple. Um, okay, one more. Can you tell the group about our ability to enter a flow state, which can help us find insights and data and create solutions when working? How do we sell this as a superpower to employers? Great question. Uh, you know, I was thinking about Superman and um, you know, really he, he, he worked as Clark Kent uh, I, I don't know that I would sell the superpowers because I think it's, uh, for many people, it's just too weird. Um, you could use them, you could tap into it. But uh, again, I, I, I have to give this more thought, but off the top of my head, I'd say, don't show up as Superman at work, show up as Clark Kent. And, and, you know, and then run out to the phone booth and change your clothes whenever necessary. Okay. Um, is it common for people with narcolepsy to become more sensitive to sounds? Yes, um, I, I think in one respect, narcolepsy is, is a kind of uh, HSP, it, it's a highly sensitive person. Uh, that's a broad term I know, and, and I think it can result in heightened sensitivity across different kinds of senses, so absolutely. Um, do you have any suggestions or exercises to do if I am terrified of the dark at night? You know, um, it, it's not easy, but I, I think the best way to approach fear is to face it and, and, and essentially to have a conversation with it. We recommend this in dream work when, when we're working with people with nightmares. We teach them some lucidity and we teach them to show up in the dream and turn to the thing they fear. and open a conversation like, hey, who are you? What do you want? Do you have a message for me? 
Um, it's similar with, with scary images in waking life, that we can actually approach them in a conversational way. That act, I mean, it's scary to do it, but that act, in my opinion, is the definition of courage. Courage is an action. Okay, so that was the last question. Uh, great. Well, thank you so much. Uh, thanks, everybody, for listening. Thank you for these great questions, and uh, enjoy the rest of the gathering.